the first asymmetry is the relationship to Pakistan. Uh, even if the American Central Asia policy will be less centered on its involvement in Afghanistan in the years to come, Pakistan will not disappear from the US radar, on the contrary. And the specificities of this US-Pakistani relationship that really shape the way the US are looking at the region drastically impact on the transatlantic relationship as Europe doesn't share the same privilege but ambivalent partnership with Islamabad. And this US focus on linking Central Asia to South Asia maybe remains something that is difficultly understandable seen from the European point of view. The second asymmetry is the relation to Russia. The US has thought to distance Central Asia from Russia both economically and strategically in order to promote their autonomy from the former Soviet center. But since Europe shares a continent with Russia, the European Union does not seek to exclude Russia per se from the Central Asian landscape and will continue to perceive this region as partly linked to Moscow's evolution. And the third asymmetry, which is still a potential one, but one that could develop in the years to come, is depending on the future of the South Mediterranean region. Here also, Europe, Europe will have to work on one way or another with political changes coming from the Middle East because of geographical proximity, but also because of the number of people originated from this region who are now European citizens. And this Mediterranean prism could one day impact on the way Europe is, but not the US, interpret forthcoming changes in Central Asia. But once these geostrategic uh, divergence that are mentioned, US and Europe share more or less the same agenda in the region, especially in terms of value promotion and on the way they define long-term stability for the region. Another element that is important to mention that makes US and Europe on the same boat in Central Asia is that they are not the most influential actor in the region and they will never be because the region is not at the center of their diplomatic and financial attention. And I think it's important here really to speak the language of through and to recognize European and American need to prioritize engagement abroad. The kind of grand design discourse that presents Central Asia at the heart of Asia or the crossroad of the old continent not only misses the point, but does not help the state's concern. In having them believe that they are more important than what they actually are, are through narratives based on the 19th century geopolitical reading of the region, European and American foreign policy goals have become unreadable for the local Central Asian elites. And the old formula of whoever controlled Heartland controlled the world is no longer appropriate. And indeed, the great game for Central Asia could rather be a great gap if no, the US or Europe are really interested in pay, uh, paying a high price for the region. And last point, in a time of financial scarcity on both sides of the Atlantic, trying to coordinate and when possible to mutualize funds and activities in the region seems to be a reasonable choice for maintaining influence in Central Asia at a relatively modest or even de decreasing financial commitment. I think we can offer less but demand more to the region in terms of accountability and less money for Central Asia is not a problem if this money is allocated well and better distributed. And I think there is no better head to give to this country than to ask their leads to be held accountable, both to their donors and to their own constituencies. Of course, coordinating policies, it's a difficult task because bureaucracies have their own dynamics and sometimes coordination just creates more bureaucracies than less. But at least there is a large convergence of interest between US and Europe in Central Asia, and there is probably room for more synergy, and at least for an open debate on that. And that's what we will try to do here today through two sessions. The first session, we will discuss globally European and American agenda in the region, the value issue, the geostrategic positioning, and the role of business in promoting uh, European and American values. And for the second panel at five this afternoon, we will be very honored to receive, uh, uh, to have with us Patricia Flo, the EU Special Representative for Central Asia from the European External Action Service in Brussels, and Lynn Tracy, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs. So we will have the, a view from the policymaker side. So let me now open the first uh, uh, session. We have four speakers. Uh, and we will begin with Jan Bonstra, senior researcher, head of UCAM program and based uh, uh, at Fried in the Brussels uh, office. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, 
Uh, very happy to be here again in uh, Washington and uh, to uh, discuss with you uh, Central Asia and the developments there. I plan to uh, do three things uh, quite briefly, tell a little bit about the EU strategy uh, for Central Asia, then uh, a few points about the development aid that uh, Europe delivers to that region and the problems uh, surrounding this development aid, and then maybe a few ideas how the EU and US on some issues could maybe join forces uh, increasingly. So to start with uh, European policies, in 2007 uh, the EU uh, developed a strategy for Central Asia. It's quite a, a substantial document outlining seven priorities ranging from values to energy, from security to education. It's very ambitious and it's not backed up by sufficient resources to meet all those uh, uh, objectives and uh, ambitions. Five years later, uh, the only achievements that I really see is uh, the EU uh, has a more stronger presence in the region. Uh, delegation or embassies, uh, you can also call them, of the EU have been opened in Kyrgyzstan, in Tajikistan, and recently also in Uzbekistan. And the EU also ho hopes to soon uh, open one in Turkmenistan. Already earlier, there was an EU delegation in uh, Kazakhstan. Structures have been uh, developed to regularly meet uh, with, uh, with uh, the elites of Central Asia. That's a development. And uh, the relationship between Kazakhstan and Europe might also be a development, especially in trade. So these are three things that, that uh, are quite positive over the last few years. But on the other side, we had quite big hopes that there would be gas flowing from uh, Turkmenistan to Europe. No, this has not happened and is unlikely to happen for the foreseeable future. The basis of this strategy is stability and security. The region is now more insecure than five years ago, at least in my opinion. The strategy is also quite keen on democratic values, human rights, uh, rule of law. We see that human rights de are deterior deteriorating in the region and democracy is an issue that is just not discussed. Um, and the last thing that the EU is very keen on is regional cooperation. And regional cooperation, though mostly externally driven, is largely absent in Central Asia. Uh, last November, uh, the High Representative for uh, External Policy, uh, Baroness Ashton, visited the region for the first time. Um, of course, it has never been a priority for Europe uh, to go there. That's why it took such a long time for the High Representative to go there. Civil society organizations in Europe had really hoped that she would come up with something new, that something new would be proposed there. But unfortunately, uh, this was not the case. And also in the review that the EU did after five years of strategy, um, there was little change. Basically, the EU said, we are happy and satisfied with the current strategy. It's still valid, uh, only we want to focus more on the threat that might be coming uh, from Afghanistan over the coming years. Uh, may be true, I find it sometimes a bit short-sighted. But EU policy is not the only European policy towards Central Asia. There's also still the member states that some of them are quite active, especially Germany. Germany has embassies in all uh, five countries, quite a lot of interests, but also smaller member states that have stepped up, like Finland, uh, non-member states like Switzerland and Norway, and so on. Um, let me move now to the uh, development funding. Uh, the EU has been spending over the last seven years, the EU uses cycles of seven years uh, in, it, uh, in its budget, has been spending over the last seven years uh, 750 million euro, it's about 900 uh, uh, million dollars, uh, I think, which is an extremely small amount if you compare that to what the EU does in development aid in its eastern neighborhood. So in uh, the Caucasus or Eastern Europe, and it's almost neglectable if you compare it to the money that is spent in the southern neighborhood in North Africa and the Middle East. It's basically it's 30 million per country per year. Still, you can also say that it's quite a substantial amount if you look at the absorption capacity of some of these countries, uh, what they can usefully do with this money. This money can basically be doubled if you add the amount of national uh, European countries, what they have been spending. And 
due to the crisis and also the importance or non-importance of Central Asia on the political radar of the EU, there's probably no rise expected. And probably this little amount will uh, stay the same. If you look at the sort of countries uh, that Europe uh, supports, basically you could say uh, from now on, uh, or at least for the coming budget cycle, EU will say Kazakhstan is too rich, so no funding will go there. Turkmenistan is too closed. Of course, there is some effort, but difficult. Uzbekistan is too repressive, difficult to work. So the focus is on Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the poorest countries in the region. So how does the EU uh, spend uh, its development aid? And I'm quite generalizing uh, here. First, uh, there is uh, one third of the money goes to initiatives on regional cooperation. The EU likes to think in regions and wants to bring countries around the table. This is not difficult. It has been, or this is very difficult. The EU has succeeded in bringing countries around the table around three subjects, uh, education, uh, water, and uh, there is also investment, uh, which is uh, discussed, and rule of law. Quite a typical strange issue to discuss uh, in a regional format. Uh, well, this is quite an achievement. Uh, there's only little funds uh, uh, sent here and not much concrete, con concrete uh, aspects come out of this. Uh, as I said, the EU thinks in regions. Some regions have been complaining, like in the Balkans at one point said, uh, different countries said that they were quite uh, fed up with group therapy uh, organized by the EU. Uh, we have not come to that point in Central Asia yet. Uh, the national uh, way or the bilateral way to spend funds is uh, in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan budget support or sector budget support. This is very tricky for the EU and the EU next to the World Bank is the only ones uh, doing this uh, in these two countries. Because of the problem is corruption. How are, can you assure that this money is wisely spent? It's called sector budget support because, for instance, uh, basically the EU says, makes an agreement, we give you this amount of money over the coming years to build three hospitals. But that's it. So these countries can decide themselves how to do the job. So the money can disappear in corruption maybe, and then for only one-tenth of the amount in the last moment, three very simple hospitals are built. Uh, this is quite black and white what I say, but it's, it's, it's problematic. It also has advantages because the EU creates uh, uh, quite a good relationship with these countries and uh, them uh, accounting uh, for the funds. Uh, the second uh, manner is uh, quite large projects done by consultancy firms from Europe or other uh, regions. And here, uh, civil society in Central Asia, but also governments in Central Asia are quite critical because they say, we see so much funds allocated to our region or our country that we don't see anything concrete. It stays in Europe. Or uh, Australian-American consultancy firms uh, are hired. So this is uh, also uh, something to look into. Uh, and again, a capacity problem of not having enough people on the ground. Uh, lastly, uh, civil society. The EU does its best to support civil society, but it's uh, also quite problematic because there is little civil society in Central Asia and it's difficult to find the right organizations. But then the EU has all these rules, so it's very difficult to apply. If you have an idea as a small NGO and you go for funding, then you will get the funding at the soonest one year later, while the idea might have been become obsolete. Also, you will need to find uh, additional funding, which is a demand, which is not very easy. So, this is the way the EU uh, operates concerning development aid. Uh, let me conclude uh, with a few ideas, maybe on EU-US uh, cooperation. We did a meeting like this two months ago in Brussels, and uh, uh, there was one of the speakers there who said concerning uh, EU-US cooperation and would like to repeat this, that indeed they are quite close to the interest, but parallel policies meet in infinity. And that makes it indeed quite difficult to really do things together, although uh, we are quite close, because we share commitments on democracy and human rights. We share a lot of security interests, although we go, go sometimes in a different way about them. 
Of course, we have different trade interests, but still, on energy, there is uh, also a common ground. Um, big difference, I think, at the moment between the US and the EU is how we see the region. The US sees the region through a lens of Afghanistan and through a lens of Asia. Europe sees the region as a neighbors of our neighbors, or in a Eurasian perspective, a sort of continuation. So this is quite uh, different. Um, very quickly, uh, four points. I mentioned earlier civil society. I know that uh, US uh, AID goes a little bit different, differently about funding civil society than the EU, and in that sense it would be very interesting that at least uh, more information is exchanged. Sometimes the EU and US could jointly fund civil society organizations in the region, uh, which would create a stronger uh, basis uh, for a civil society. So an exchange of information in that field. Uh, second, and this is an issue that uh, other speakers uh, might uh, also uh, discuss more because I haven't, is uh, border control. Border management is, an, is a huge issue, especially on the border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. Uh, border control is not, uh, is not effective and the support to border control is also not effective. Russia does its own support and uh, maybe the EU and US can sit around the table to come up with ideas how to really effectively support this, not in material but in training, in reform and so on. Third, maybe we can create more leverage on uh, governments to actually uh, do something about reform if joining forces. And lastly, the OECE, uh, an organization that is uh, not doing well, maybe with the exception of Tajikistan where it's quite an uh, influential player. And this is maybe uh, an option where the EU and US do most of the, the funding of this organization to look into it. Positive is that uh, all are engaged in uh, the OECE, including Russia and the Central Asian states. But the negative point is that all are engaged, also Russia and the Central Asian states, so that they can block basically everything uh, that uh, we would like to do. Maybe conflict prevention, an issue that can be taken up again. Uh, hopefully we can discuss these points. Thanks, Malena. Thank you, Jos, for this overview of the EU policy and the global challenges it faces. Our second speaker is Alexander Coulet, professor at Bar Barnard College in New York. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, I think Jos uh, and Marlene have said everything uh, that. I was going to touch on now. Uh, it, it's a great, great pleasure to be here, and I also really want to commend uh, Marlene for the wonderful job she's doing with the center here, and 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 having four like the like this. Just it's it's a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous uh, privilege uh, for me to address it, and also thank you to UCAM for this. Uh, there are a lot of common interests and common goals that the EU and the U.S. share, and I'm going to. Uh, there are some obvious ones, perhaps some not so obvious ones. And so what I want to do today is flag three big types of issues that I see going forward that both the EU and the US have an interest in and are still in the policy, uh, uh, in the middle of crafting of. Uh, and they all, I would argue, um, relate to the security and stability of the region. Uh, and I think there are points of real cooperation here, uh, but my final one I think is going to show some divergence. Um, so uh, let me uh, discuss these for about three, four minutes each. The first one is the current regional uncertainty and tensions over what's going to happen post-2014. Right, so there is a kind of upheaval of perceptions in the region that actors in the region share, Moscow certainly shares, Beijing shares, people who track China sort of see how the discourse of the last 18 months have changed from, you know, when are you going to, you know, get out of Manas uh, to, isn't it irresponsible that you're getting out on such a sort of arbitrary sort of timetable? And I think this, this gets at a sense that no one knows what's going to happen. Um, but in some ways, it doesn't matter for the politics. 
right? The fact that when, you know, whether we have all these external threats spilling over or not, and Marlene's done a great job holding workshops to debunk that, it doesn't matter if it sets into motion certain perceptions of insecurity amongst actors on the ground, right? And so I think both sides have a real interest in trying to be transparent about what they're doing, uh, but also not to fuel some of the resulting regional animosities. Um, so it's not being caused by NATO withdrawal, and I would never argue that, but it's being fueled by NATO withdrawal and thinking about what lies post-2014. Uh, we see a change in Russian policy, I would argue, regarding the region. We've, we've seen uh, uh, a shift from trying to be everything to everyone to a much more focused, concentrated attempt to create more traditional client-state relationships, both with Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. I would say Kyrgyzstan is yielding uh, perhaps more concrete achievements than Tajikistan at the moment, but you see things like attempting to consolidate all military facilities under one wing. You see an aid, military aid and assistance package of 1.2 billion, uh, much of it sort of border uh, 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 types of equipment. Um, you see investment in hydro, you see the write-off of debt, bilateral debt, but unlike 2009 when they're going to write it off all in one point, they're going to sequence it now and write it off steadily over uh, the course of a number of years. So you see a real attempt to consolidate and fold Kyrgyzstan into um, uh, the Russian orbit and of course uh, 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 by all indications, Kyrgyzstan wants to join the customs union uh, by the end of the fall. So why is this important? This is important because we're, we're starting to see changes in regional balances, the onset of what we international relations scholars like to refer to as security dilemma, that, that actions taken by one country to make themselves secure necessarily make another country insecure. Uh, so now you throw into the mix this process of NATO withdrawal, right? Um, uh, UK and Germany have to leave vis-a-vis -vis the North, right? The US has more options, but they also have a lot more volume. Um, the question of uh, left behind military equipment, uh, question of sort of future security assistance, and this is all potentially combustible at the regional level. Now, let me be clear. The argument here is not that somehow NATO withdrawing is going to alter the strategic balance of forces, right, or, or balance of power. That's not it. But when it comes to the border, Right? and the hardening of the border, the militarization of the border, there I think we need to be careful. Uh, and especially the formalization of a lot of things, especially in the enclaves that used to be informal, used to rely on norms, have the potential, I think, um, to militarize. Uh, and that you know, external interests, uh, whether on purpose or not, can potentially feed these dynamics. So the question of the regional issues, the water management issues, the enclaves, the borders, um, and how that is fed into uh, by external powers, I think that's really important um, moving forward. And I think both the EU and the US are actors in this um, and, and, and need to coordinate and take appropriate um, steps. Uh, second. I would say there, I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned the question of conflict prevention going forward, as well as sort of talked about, and Marlene talked about, well, the US and the EU aren't the most important actors. Who, you know, who is? Russia and China. I think that's clear. But I think there's also a question about um, what determines political stability going forward, right? So it's, it's, it's conventional wisdom to say the US, the EU, China, and Russia all want political stability in the region. It's probably true. But the question of the assumptions of conflict management, the assumptions of political stability, um, uh, I think when you start unpacking those, you see very different answers in the EU and the US on the one hand, and Beijing on the other. Russia, I think, is, is sort of a special variant um, of the two. So what do I mean? Um, first of all, uh, the EU-US model, what preserves political order, is, is, is founded on a number of well known things. So I think what we'd call is kind of, you know, the liberal peace building stability model. There are things like uh, respect for the rule of law, good governance, um, voice and participation, inclusion of ethnic minorities, um, good governance, democratization, um, you know, dealing tolerantly with religious uh, revival and so forth. Um, doesn't mean that these are practiced always. Um, it just means that these are the assumptions on which uh, conflict uh, prevention rests. 
Uh, that's not the case for an organization like the SEO, right? So if, if, if the model, the Western model is sort of this kind of grievance model, like what is it that fosters conflict, these sort of grievances, the SEO is, is more in the line in Beijing, more in the line of, of, of opportunity structure. Right, that a lot of these things are just covers for instability, for political chaos. If you look at the really negative reaction Beijing had to the 2005 Tulip Revolution, it was in part driven by the fact that somehow the West could take at face value that this was a call for democracy, right? In, in, in Kyrgyzstan, it was coded as so. You know, Beijing saw this as political opportunism, generating chaos on its border and potentially sort of spreadable. So my point here is that uh, China and Russia, and, and Russia, I would say, views stability as, as political loyalty and as something that can't really be solved. It's something that has to be managed, right? And you see this sort of in, in the North Caucasus. So the question becomes, there's a kind of grievance versus opportunity structure going forward. And when you look at the aftermath of Osh in 2010, um, the events in Barakshan uh, in Tajikistan, uh, there's just some fundamental philosophical differences about how do you deal with the question of political order. Now, let's throw into that mix everything that everyone here knows is going to happen over the next few years, or probably happen, right? Political succession, rising nationalism, more corruption, governance issues, uh, and the potential for disorder and conflict only grows. And so managing this is going to come on the radar. There's some other ways in which this manifests itself, too. Um, written a little bit recently about some of the extraterritorial security activities that um, the Minsk Convention and the SCO Treaty are enabling in the region. And the bottom line here is that what you've seen is the way to deal with threats, especially under the SCO charters, to create common consolidated lists that are managed by rats and that internal security services have a set without a clear sense of what are the procedures for listing and delisting. Uh, and from the point of view of sort of international law, what's, what, what I think is striking about this trend is that increasingly um, uh, security officials and legal officials in the Central Asian countries themselves are using both the SCO convention and the MIS convention to justify um, uh, the revocation of political asylum, its denial, um, you know, shipping out uh, political suspects, um, um, and so-called extremists from one country to the other. In other words, we're creating this new regional layer, I would argue, of sort of counter norms um, on the basis, again, of maintaining political order um, and stability. So um, yes, uh, certainly uh, we have a common sense of that we want the region to be stable. We don't want chaos. But I think the more you dig into this, I think the more you see divergence between the Chinese and the Russian position on one hand and the West on the other. And I think these positions are just going to keep diverging um, as the region faces its challenges. A secondary point about this, and, and you, you just mentioned sort of the developmental model, you see the rise of China as a preeminent donor now in the region. Now, on the one hand, you say, that's great. China's building roads. No one else is, right? in some of these places and rewiring the region, that's good. You know, on the other hand, there are some issues about accountability, about transparency, about the fact that in some of these roads, as in Tajikistan, you have toll booths that go up a few weeks after they're completed uh, with an offshore company that owns the revenue stream. It doesn't seem that that's actually sort of helping the Tajik people the way it was intended to. So the governance issue um, is important. And I think the displacement of Western IFIs by China um, is an issue of growing important in international order um, because China is still not coordinating with um, other donors the way it does in certain other parts of the world in this part of the world. Final set of issues I want to uh, talk about is integrating Central Asia in the world economy, right? Again, there's a common sense uh, in Brussels and in Washington that we want Central Asia uh, to be more connected, to foster economic development. In the US, this is crystallized in the so-called New Silk Route initiative. I won't um, recap it here. It has both a hardware component and a software component, the hardware component being building new infrastructure that fosters a lot of these north-south links that US was talking about. The software component is trying to get better border management practices, improve customs, lessen corruptions, and so forth. I'm on the record as being very, very skeptical about NSR for a number of reasons. Uh, one is I think the hardware is going to clash with the software. I think the more you promote large-scale infrastructure uh, projects in the region, uh, the more likely you are to sort of foster rent-seeking. I don't see any change in the relevant data over the last few years 
that um, indicates to me that the software has become easier in, in the region. Trade volumes have increased, um, but the difficulty in trade remains uh, the same. Uh, moreover, I think the major issue that's being ignored by both the US and the EU in terms of development and potential political stability is the capital flight issue, right? You can implement NSR all you want. You can have wonderful projects, increased level of economic developments, unless you deal with the issue of capital flight from the region through offshore vehicles and destination havens, the money's not going to stay there, right? The region's not going to develop. These governments aren't going to get a tax base. And just to give you a sense of how big this problem is, although we don't talk about it, uh, the IMF estimated 2012 there was $3.5 billion capital flight from Tajikistan. That's half of its GDP, right? The Tax Justice Network estimates that since independence, there's been $109 billion uh, unaccounted for offshore from Kazakhstan, right? These are big sums of money. So until we deal with this, and unlike trade, which is an issue that happens over there, the issue of capital flight, it does directly involve U.S. and EU regulators. The question of setting up offshore accounts, um, uh, uh, enforcing the rules that are out there. Uh, me and my co-author have run a number of experiments um, on this issue. I'm happy to talk about them. But in the end, U.S. and U.K. are the most non-compliant in terms of um, playing by uh, international standards on transparency and ID on this. Uh, very final point here, and again, it relates to sort of this integration of the world economy. I just want to underscore what, what Yus was saying. Uh, I think when we talk about integrating Central Asia and the world economy, two different visions do emerge from the US and the EU, and, and when we don't talk about them as much, I think there is a real hesitancy in Brussels about the so-called de-Europeanization of Central Asia uh, that's happening, that the traditional east-west links that have been mediated by Russia um, are now giving way to this emphasis on north-south uh, and, and linking up the region uh, to Afghanistan and southern Asia. I think where the two converged, especially on the energy issue, was on the southern corridor, right? I think you know both Washington and Brussels, real proponents of the southern corridor, saw this as a way of enhancing European energy security, offering alternatives, bypassing Russia, and so forth. Southern corridor is on life support right now, uh, and this, without that, uh, it, even in the energy realms, I'm not sure there is that much overlap in terms of. European and U.S. interests anymore, right? And so, so for example, you know, take the Chinese pipeline, taking gas um, eastward kind of thing. Well, you know, we support this um, in Washington because we see this as a way of enhancing sovereign security, lessening dependence on Russia, and so forth. Uh, but in reality, if this is also providing Turkmenistan uh, uh, with adequate revenues uh, to askew having to go in the southern corridor, or worse still, if China pressures Turkmenistan never to build a southern corridor, uh, then I think both countries need to start understanding it uh, in more geopolitical terms. Um, and, and I'll just sort of leave you with this. What is the EU and the US position on Turkmenistan, for instance, becoming client state of China? Which has happened very quickly, by the way, over the last sort of two years. It's not clear to me. So I think on the economics, again, Marlene is absolutely right. You are absolutely right. The, the, the values are very similar. A lot of the goals and the objectives are very similar, um, but when you start peeling away the actual uh, reworking of the region, uh, especially on the energy, uh, I, th I think there are areas of, of, of potential divergence here. Thanks. Thank you, Alex, for the, this great overview of the regional landscape and the difficult situation for US and Europe, this positioning toward Russia and China. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and discussion during the, the Q&A session. Our third speaker is Jeff Lundstein, Senior Policy uh, thank you. As normally happens these, at these events, the farther you are down in the batting order, the more you have to cross out of what you're going to say because it's been said already. Uh, I will try not to repeat too much of what you've already heard. Um, as Jos and Marlene have, have indicated, there is a fair degree of commonality in terms of basic interests between the U.S. and the EU looking at Central Asia, the EU Central Asia strategy, this security and stability as core interests, talks about a strong interest in peaceful, democratic, and economically prosperous Central Asia. In 2010, when they did their three-year review of the Central Asia strategy, they identified four areas where they wanted to work more, human rights, rule of law and democracy, 
security, water and energy, and Afghanistan. Meanwhile, on this side of the Atlantic, in 2009, when the Obama administration did their review of U.S. policy in Central Asia, they came up with five very similar strategic priorities for engagement, supporting the war in Afghanistan, energy sector, developing trade and investment, supporting political economic reform, and with a nod towards Tajikistan in particular, preventing failed states. This is the theory, but let's look at the practice. Uh, the practice, as I think those of us around Washington have seen for the last four to five years, is that U.S. policy is, as you also mentioned, an offshoot of policy towards Afghanistan. Uh, and while we're talking about the U.S. and the EU, I think it would be a mistake to look at the EU as a monolith, because I think this is also true of a very large number of European Union member states, particularly those militarily engaged in Afghanistan, particularly countries like Germany and Britain, which definitely tend to look at Central Asia through an Afghanistan lens. The EU itself has been mentioned has much more of a focus on uh, hydrocarbons. That seems to be something that's sort of declined in priority in the United States over time. But the result of this, when you look at American and British and German policy, in Central Asia over the last four to five years has been a policy that's been skewed towards security relationships and towards doing everything to avoid uh, angering the people who have their jackboots across the supply lines leading to your troops in Afghanistan. So how have these policies succeeded? I mean, if you look at it in the most narrow sense, they have succeeded admirably. The supplies kept flowing even when the supply lines in Pakistan were cut off. Without the Northern Distribution Network, the militaries of the U.S. and its allies would have been in very serious trouble. Uh, and our budget deficit would be even a lot more than it is now because flying stuff in by air is obviously significantly more expensive. The problem is that this policy has really done little to address issues that present the greatest medium to long-term threat to stability in the region. Some of the things we've talked about already, democratic development, declining human rights standards, lack of any rules, let alone democratic procedures for deciding who comes next when the current generation of autocrats dies off or otherwise leaves power, problems of governance and corruption, the fact that economic and political influence and power have become incredibly intertwined in these areas on the level of the Gulf, I would say. A lack of development, declining human capital and infrastructure. And, you know, it's nice when you look at Casa 1000 and a few big holiday, ho highways being built, but the fact is that infrastructure is, with the exception of Kazakhstan, really falling apart. Uh, not to mention the fact that mass immigration is creating a brain drain. So, you know, where are the hospitals going to be that are going to serve the next generation of Central Asians? And where are the doctors who are going to work in these hospitals should they be built? The thing that I find kind of confusing about all this is it's not because the U.S. and the EU have different understandings of what the security threats in the regions are. Uh, and uh, to illustrate this point, I'd like to quote the U.S. intelligence community's most recent worldwide threat assessment, which has one paragraph on Central Asia. And it states that Central Asian leaders have prioritized regime stability over political and economic reforms that could improve long-term governance and legitimacy. Most fear any signs of Arab Spring-type uprisings and repress even small signs of discontent. The Central Asian states have not built constructive relationships with each other. Personal rivalries and long-standing disputes over borders, water, and energy create bilateral frictions between neighbors and potential flashpoints for conflict. Ethnic conflicts are also possible and could emerge with little warning. Uh, as we've heard earlier, uh, there's also the question of, do the US and the EU believe that there's a real extremist threat? to Central Asia, as many of the leaders in Central Asia claim there is. Uh, 
Uh, very recently, Assistant Secretary of State Blake testified on the Hill on this issue, and he came out quite forthrightly that the United States does not see a short-term extremist threat in Central Asia. And yet, over the last few years, as OSF's uh, funded research has determined, the vast majority of U.S. assistance to Central Asia has been focused on security, be it border security, counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism, military assistance and training. So we have this odd situation where these countries seem to believe that there is one threat, one set of threats to their long-term interests and a policy that addresses a very different set of issues. Um, we look at it now, Alex raised the issue of excess defense articles. I mean, both the U.S. and the EU claim to be concerned about the tensions among the Central Asians, and yet they're all planning to leave excess defense articles in these countries. So again, you have a policy and a set of interests that seem to be not very well matched up. I think to better pursue their interests in the region, the U.S. and the EU need to rethink their approaches. And I think the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, the end of foreign involvement in day-to-day -day combat, provides an opportunity to do this. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. It also provides a very significant danger. Because a real possibility, and some in this town would say likelihood, is that once Afghanistan is off the map, policymakers here and in Brussels aren't going to care. And certainly, History uh, does provide some examples of this. In 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2001 to 2002, U.S. assistance to Central Asia went up 30 percent right after 9/11. It then went back down very quickly to pre-2001 levels until 2008, when it went up 30 percent again because of the need to open the NDN. So, what happens when the NDN goes away? If you look at history, there's a real possibility that the assistance stream will fall off, that the interest will fall off. And I think those of us who work on Central Asia believe this would be a mistake. I think there are a lot of reasons why Central Asia will remain important. Uh, you know, assuming that we still care about Afghanistan, the eventual outcome in Afghanistan is going to depend in part to the situation in Central Asia. They are still linked. And while we can argue about whether there's a lot of sense in New Silk Road, that linkage is, I think, justified. Um, the shale oil and gas revolution has certainly changed the worldwide hydrocarbons picture, but we're still talking about some of the world's greatest reservoirs of untapped hydrocarbons in Central Asia, and those are very much in the geostrategic interests of Washington and Brussels. And finally, you know, looking at this neighborhood, security problems in a region that's surrounded by Iran, Russia, China, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, problems that arise there are conceivably going to have a significant impact. So I think it's very important that the countries stay engaged. And I have three uh, recommendations, I think, of what needs to be done. I think that contrary to what a lot of people say, I think the interests and the values of the U.S. and the EU dovetail very nicely in Central Asia. Both say they want stability and security. And they both recognize, as we saw from the statement by the intelligence community in the United States, that the major threats to those are domestic. They are the uh, autocratic policies of the states. They're issues like corruption, lack of employment, income disparities, uh, lack of rule of law, lack of any opportunity for people to participate meaningfully in the political light of their life of their country. These are the kind of the issues that the U.S. and the EU need to do more to work on. So now the question is, what leverage do they have to accomplish this? I mean, the Central Asians, uh, as we've heard, do not consider the U.S. and the EU to be the most important neighbors. But I spent some time in East Asia, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that powerful but distant neighbors are, are powerful but distant countries are always a good thing for local players because they can be used to play off against powerful and nearer neighbors who, by virtue of proximity, and this is a case where geography is destiny, are far more threatening. These countries don't want the U.S. and Europe to walk away. 
which is why over the last several years I've had uh, an issue with the risk-averse nature of U.S. policy. We seem to be deathly afraid that Karimov is going to kick us out and cut off the NDN. If Karimov does that, he has left mano a mano with Vladimir Putin. And I don't think, based on everything we've seen over many years, that this is a situation he wants. I think the US and the EU need to do a better job of looking very specifically at what it is that each country in the region wants or needs from them. In the US, at least, and I don't know as much about the EU, I defer to Joss on this, Yas on this, uh, seems to think that it's in a situation where it needs Central Asia more than the Central Asians need the United States. I would argue with that, but even if you assume it's true, there is such a thing as playing a weak hand well and playing a weak hand poorly. I can't tell you how frustrating it was to spend months knocking on every door I could find in the US government trying to make the point that the one thing Kazakhstan wanted out of their OSC chairmanship was a birthday present for Nazarbayev in the form of an OSCE summit in Kazakhstan on his 75th birthday, and noting that the US had a veto over this and asking what is it the US intends to get in response, and watching the interagency grind away for months and months and not make up its mind. Uh, I hope that the, that the EU has learned this lesson uh, and there now have some human rights conditionality, for example, in their negotiations over an enhanced PCA with Kazakhstan, and I hope they will stick to their guns. I think the US and the EU need to do a much better job at public messaging. Right now, the public message seems to focus on how it's going to play with the elites and the governments, and not how it's going to play with the locals, who are actually the majority of the people in the region. So for example, when Madame Flor was in uh, Uzbekistan recently, she listed all the issues she talked about at her press conference. In her, she listed in her press conference all the issues she discussed with the leadership there. The last thing she mentioned was human rights. When Foreign Minister Kamila was here, uh, in his press statement, Secretary Kerry mentioned that we were very glad to have this talk, or would be glad to have the talk about our issues that we work on very hard in Afghanistan. And we have other issues, uh, human rights, uh, other issues. And that's almost a quote, actually. Um, when Secretary Clinton went to Uzbekistan the last time, she did not have a public civil society event. Almost the only case I can find in her travels where that did not happen. When Madame Flor was recently in Kazakhstan, her civil society event took place at the Nazarbayev University. These things send signals, and they're bad signals, and the policy needs to be uh, revised. Finally, one last thing, because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, I think the definition of security really needs to be rethought, and the definition of security assistance needs to be rethought. You also mentioned the work that uh, the EU is doing on BOMCA now, and you know, the, Alex mentioned border assistance as being something that, in, in essence, the OSCE settled on because nobody was against it, and the OSCE, that's the sine qua non of doing anything is nobody can object. But when you look at things like counterterrorism assistance, border control assistance, counter narcotics assistance, military training, military equipping, these are all designed to affect threats from the outside. And yet, again, we have the US and EU saying that the main threats actually are generated inside. And so I think that a real review of policy and, of course, security assistance priorities needs to come out of this. Should we be working more, for example, on things like helping to create jobs, dealing with governance so that more Western companies can invest? Can they be working more on things like corruption? I think this broader view, what, what many people describe as human security, is the approach that needs to be taken rather than the current focus on more traditional externally driven security threats.